the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, the Lord is my banner, saying, a hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Amen. You may have your seats in the presence of the Lord. The grass withers and the flower thereof, it fades away, but the word of our God, it shall stand forever. I want to preach from this thought tonight, victory in dry places. Victory in dry places. Miracles have a certain magnetic quality to them that draw us into the moment and lead us to linger in the place and the space where God demonstrates his miraculous power on our behalf. We like to linger and stay in the space of the miraculous. We want to live at the Red Sea because the Red Sea is exciting. It is electrifying. But church family, I would like to suggest to you tonight that while the miraculous power of God may deliver us, ultimately, it is the wilderness that God will use to develop us. And so it is, church family, Moses leads the children of Israel away from the Red Sea and end to the wilderness. Our destination is set in the Exodus narrative. The 19th chapter of Exodus tells us the destination is Sinai. The place where Moses has met God. Yeah, yeah. The place where he now will take this people of God to meet their God. Yeah. According to the timetable of Exodus chapter 19 and verse 1, it will be a three-month journey away from the waters of the Red Sea, south in the Sinai Peninsula to the mountain of God. Yeah, yeah. As Moses leads the children of Israel on this journey to the mountain of God, the Exodus writer invites us on this pilgrimage between Exodus chapters 14 and 19. He invites us to join in the journey with the children of Israel to meet their God. And for our benefit, my brothers and sisters, he navigates this journey through this narrative with names of seemingly meaningless places unto us that within the Exodus narrative are embedded with explosions of grace that are intended to teach the children of Israel lessons about their God on their way to the mountain to meet their God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These names mean little or nothing to you and me tonight but they are embedded with what I call explosions of grace. Yeah, yeah. 
Mara means little or nothing to us, but Mara is the place where they would learn that God is able to heal broken and bitter situations. Elim means nothing to us, but Elim is the place where they discovered that God will provide an oasis in the middle of the wilderness. 72 palm trees are there and 12 well springs of water that the children of Israel might fill their canteens and might allow their animals to drink. The wilderness of Zin means nothing to us. But embedded in this seemingly obscure geographic location, they discover a powerful lesson of divine provision. Yeah, yeah. God opening his kitchen for breakfast hours, taking the dew that, uh, that majestically matriculates from the heavens to lay upon the terra firma of the earth, the carpet. Uh, when the sun dries the dew, they discover that that dew became bread cakes from heaven. They ask the question, what is this? It is manna, but that God's kitchen not only keeps breakfast hours, but God also has a dinner menu quail in the evening hours for them uh, to not only have food in the morning but food in the evening this geographical location means nothing to us but it is a place of provision for the children of israel these explosions of grace these pictures of provision that we get on the journey from the red sea to the mountain of god of sinai and now, my brothers and sisters, as we enter into the 17th chapter of Exodus, this Exodus writer navigates this journey for us in this narrative with another seemingly meaningless name. Verse 1 tells us they come to a place called Rephidim. Rephidim in our text, it means a place of room, but it is also a place of tension. It's a place of tension according to the text because there is no water for them to drink at Rephidim. In Exodus chapter 15, when they were in the location named Elim, there were 12 water springs there for them to drink. They were shaded by palm trees. But now as Moses leads the children of Israel deeper into the wilderness of Sinai, Moses leads them away from water. And as they approach the outskirts of the mountain of God known as Sinai, and they come to this seemingly insignificant location, Rephidim, they have come to a dry place. A dry place, my brothers and sisters. Uh, and at this dry place, temperatures begin to rise. The, 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 the temperature that rises, friends, is not an atmospheric temperature. I'm not speaking of the dry, arid, dusty, remote conditions uh, in which the Israelites now travel as they go southward into the Sinai Peninsula. No, uh, friends, tonight I suggest to you uh, that the spiritual te temperature of the children of Israel is rising. As they realize that Moses has now led them into a dry place. I, I don't know if you have your Bibles with you tonight. You can read the story afresh when you go home. But in verses 2 and 3 and 4, the Bible says at verse 3 that they quarrel against Moses. Not only do they quarrel against Moses at verse 4, it says that the quarreling graduates to grumbling. That they grumble against Moses, wondering why Moses has led them into this dry place. Um, to by the time we arrive at verse 5, the quarreling that has turned to grumbling has now graduated to a full out rebellion. Uh, for Moses is afraid to pass before the children of Israel for fear that they might stone him at Rephidim. 
Uh, the temperature of this text is rising in verses 2 and rising in verse 3, rising in verse 4, rising in verse 5, rising in verse 6, and it reaches a red hot level in verse 7. When the Bible renames this seemingly obscure place Rephidim, this place of space, this place of room that now Moses has led the children of Israel to, the Bible renames this place Massah and Meribah. Uh, the place where the children of Israel wrestled and strove with God. They tempted and they tested God. Yeah, yeah. Now let's be clear, my brothers and sisters. Even though to the naked eye, to the surface eye, Rephidim seems like a dry place, there is water at Rephidim. Although they don't know where it is and they don't know how to get it, there is water at Rephidim. Can I tell you how I know there's water at Rephidim? God gives Moses specific instructions to take his staff and to go and to strike a rock and that inside the rock there he would find water for the children of Israel. Rephid there is water at Rephidim. Rephidim is a place of provision. Left out a word, let me say it this way. Rephidim is another place of provision. Oh yeah, Nara was a place of provision. The wilderness of Shore was a place of provision. The wilderness of, Z of Zin was a place of provision. Elim was a place of provision. And just like those places were places of provision, this place of Rephidim is also a place of provision. But verse 7 of the text tells us that instead of this place being a place of provision, it becomes a place of provocation. Instead of this being another site of God's miraculous power, it becomes a site of mess. Instead of this being a place of another explosion of the goodness and the grace of God, it becomes a place of contention and fighting and striving with God. Allow me to park here parenthetically to ask you maybe the tense question of this text. How many places in your life has God intended to be places of provision? But because you could not trust God, you turned the place of provision into the place of provocation. I wish I had a witness in here. How many blessings have you traded in on the altar of your frustrations? How much of your future have you exchanged on the altar of your temporary discomfort? How much of your destiny have you exchanged on the altar of your disappointment? How many places in your life have turned into places of provocation that God intended to be places of provision? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pastor, I know you may be disappointed where you are at this point in place and space of your ministry, but it could be that God intended to bless you at Rephidim, but you turned it into a Mariba and a Masa. Y'all are looking at me like y'all haven't read the Bible. This place, Marib and Massa, will live in the lore and the history of Israel infamously. The 95th Psalm will record it at verses 4, 5, 6, and 7, where the psalmist says at verse 4 that the children of Israel are his people. Oh, I know you thought that was just in, in Psalm 100, but read it in Psalm 95 at verse 4. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture, signifying that God always provides for his people. God always takes care of his people. God is not an absentee creator. God is not guilty of child neglect. God does not owe back child support. Whatever God creates, God sustains. Whatever God redeems, God is able to restore. But the psalmist says, harden not your hearts. In the day that you hear my voice as you did in the day of provocation at Mariba and Massa where you 
tested the Lord. Uh, this place, friends, ought to be a place of provision, but instead it becomes a place of provocation. And listen to the provocative interrogative of the text. Here it is. Is the Lord among us or not? That's the cliffhanger question of verse 7, isn't it? Is the Lord among us or not? Moses, is he easy or is he ain't he? Is he with us or is God not with us? Friends, and that's the pivot in the text. That's the turn in the narrative. That's the twist in the story. Is the Lord with us or not? It, come, come on, y'all. That's a that, that's a pro, that, that that is a provocative question. Yeah, yeah. They, they they walk out onto the deck of their frustration and call the Creator in the question. Yeah, yeah. They, 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 they they step out on the platform of their of their pity and they call the Creator up to court. They hold counsel with God. Is the Lord with us yeah. or not? Yeah, 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 yeah. Friends, tonight as I press my way, I want to suggest to you today, I'm not going to tell you never to question God. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I'm not going to tell you never to question God. Can I tell you why? Because God gave you a mind. And, and, and in giving you a mind, he gave you reason. And he gave that mind to you to be inquisitive about things. And, and church family, unless some of you have PhDs in Godology that I don't know about, there are some things about God that I don't understand. There are some ways that God moves that I am unable to be able to process. And so I'm not going to tell you tonight, don't question God. But I will caution you this. If you question God, you better prepare yourself for how God may choose to answer. I won't say that again. That, that, that if you question God, you better prepare yourself for the way that God may choose to answer. Pastor, are you making that up? No. Here it is. The question comes at verse 7. Is the Lord among us or not? Answer comes in verse 8. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. I'm going to say that a couple of more times and I'm going to see if it sinks in. Question comes at verse 7. If is the Lord among us or not? Answer comes at verse 8. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Maybe third time will be the, be, be the chance. Question, is the Lord among us or not? Answer, then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Here's, here's, here's the thing, church family. God says, I was with you when I turned bitter water to drinkable water. I was with you when I gave you manna and quail to eat in the wilderness. I was with you when I brought you to 12 water springs and oasis in the middle of the desert. I was with you when I gave you, but since you cannot appreciate my blessings, and since you can appreciate my presence through my blessings, now I'm going to have to teach you that I'm with you by allowing you to go through a battle. And I want to warn somebody here today, you better be careful about questioning God. Because what I've discovered is that God has been providing for you the whole time. God has been taking care of you the entire way of your journey. But when you can't appreciate God's blessings, when you can't appreciate God's presence through his blessings, then what God will do is God will take his hand off of you a little bit and allow you to experience what he's been keeping you from to teach you that I've been with you the entire time. Y'all yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, ain't feeling that. There's a rabbinical story that's told in, in, in Jewish midrashic tradition uh, of uh, a boy who asked the question, where is my father? 
where is my father where is my father and 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 as he asked that question a dog comes and bites the boy on his leg and he cries out in pain in anguish and the father picks the young boy up and the boy asks his father where were you and why did you allow me to get bit by this dog to which the father responds i was carrying you the entire time but when you ask where is my father i had to put you down and when I put you down, I put you in a place where a dog could get to you and bite you to show you that I had been carrying you the entire time. And some of you are suffering from spiritual dog bite tonight because God had to put you down a little bit. God had to put you in reach of some things that God has been keeping you from to teach you that I have been with you. How do you think you made it this far? How do you think you made it to where you are? How do you think you have what you have? How do you think you know what you know? How do you think you've been where you've been? I've been carrying you the entire time. And when you can't appreciate my grace, I'll let you get bit by a dog named Amalek. I, I'll let you get bit. I'm almost out of your way. By a dog named Amalek. Is the Lord among us or not? Then Amalek came. Go home, read the story again. You'll see it. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Church family, there are grace notes in this text. That there are great grace notes in this battle. And the grace note, the major grace note in this battle is this. That although they question God's presence and provoke God's wrath, God still gives them victory. I, I wish I had a witness in here. <laughs> although they provoke God's wrath in verse 7, by the time you make it to verse 16, God gives them the victory over Amalek. I know it's 1140 at night, but that's a man worthy at any time of the day. Because there's some of you here tonight, the truth of your testimony is uh, that you've gotten some victories in your life that you didn't deserve to get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But God gave you victory even uh, in a dry place. Yeah. That, 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 there's, there's victory in, in, in this encounter at Rephidim. And, and in this victory are in view, infused some lessons for us tonight uh, that we can apply to our lives. You've heard the text preached, haven't you? Oh. Amalek comes and fights uh, with, uh, with Israel at Rephidim. Yeah, yeah. Amalek comes and fights with Israel at Rephidim. Yeah. And as Amalek comes to fight with Israel at Rephidim, in verses 10 and 11, God, uh, Moses tells Joshua, you go and fight with Amalek at Rephidim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you go and fight with Amalek in Rephidim. I'm going up in a hill, uh, and me and Aaron and her are going to do something else in the hill. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you fight the battle, and, 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 and I'm going to be up in the hill. Uh, do you see Joshua in the battle, church? Haven't you read this text before? Come on, help me here tonight. H haven't you? I I'm sorry, I don't have any catch lines for you tonight. I'm just going to preach the Bible. Uh, 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 haven't you seen Joshua in the battle before? You know who Joshua is, don't you? Joshua is Moses 2.0. Joshua is Israel's next. Joshua is the warrior commander of Israel. An entire book in the Old Testament is named after Joshua. And the theme of that entire book is conquest. Joshua is a fighter. But when you go and reread the Exodus narrative, the writer in Exodus does not tell you anything of Joshua's military exploits. 
It doesn't tell you how many swords Joshua dedicated to the battle. It does not tell you of Joshua's military strategy. There is no military strategy. There is no army. There is no armory. There are only months out of Egypt. It tells you nothing of Joshua's strategy. It tells you nothing of Joshua's armory. All it tells you of Joshua is this. That Joshua obeyed everything that Moses commanded him to do. That Joshua obeyed everything that Moses commanded him to do. Why is that significant in the text? Joshua becomes a picture of faithfulness. And why is that picture significant for us tonight? Because the children of Israel were on the doorstep of rebellion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they were ready to elect another pastor. They, yeah. they were ready to go back to Egypt. They were ready to turn around and to go back home. Yeah. And yet in the middle of the rebellion, here's one man who says, I don't care how thirsty I am. I'm not turning my back on Moses. I wish I had a witness in here. I, I, I don't care how thirsty and how dry Rephidim is. I'm not turning my back on Moses. And Joshua is charged, watch this, to choose men to fight in the army against Amalek. That word choose there is significant, church family. Because in your vernacular, choose means selection. But according to the Hebrew of this text, the word choose actually means evaluation. Don't just select people to fight, evaluate their fitness to fight. Now, 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 here's the question. What makes them fit to fight? What is Joshua's standard of evaluation? Well, they're in a dry place. And their thirst has led them to the point of rebellion. So here's the standard of fitness that Joshua has to apply. Joshua has to find a group of people who haven't allowed their thirst to make them unfaithful to God. And I want to suggest to you today that we have come to a time where God is looking for some fit men and some fit women to fight in the battle against the enemy. And God is choosing according to a specific criteria. And what is that criteria? God is looking for somebody who has not allowed their thirst to make them unfaithful. I, 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 I want somebody here tonight to just be honest with me enough to testify uh, that when you're spiritually thirsty, it has a way of tempting you uh, to want to turn your back on God and be unfaithful to God. Oh yes, church family, we're in a day where people are thirsty. They're thirsty for fame and they're thirsty for money and they're thirsty for position and they're thirsty for status and they're thirsty for notoriety. And we've come to a day and a time where people are willing to say anything and they're willing to do anything. And listen, we, we bemoaned earlier the quality of preaching that has happened. We say anything for cheap amens and we say anything to, to get an emotional rise out of the room. Can I tell y'all I don't care if you don't say a word for me. Here's the thing I'm going to be faithful to what God has said because I'm not thirsty for anyone's approval. I want to be found faithful and fit for service and I wonder is there anybody here tonight who's like Joshua you don't want to be found unfit for the battle but you want to be found faithful to be used in the service of God you, 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 you got to study to show yourself approved 
a workman not uh, that, that doesn't have to be ashamed but rightly dividing the word of truth you gotta be steadfast and you gotta be unmovable preach it when they shout and preach it when they're silent preach it when they're cheering and preach it when they're pouting stand on it when it's popular stand on it when it's not popular because at the end of the day uh, it is church family our faithfulness yeah, 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 yeah. that God is looking for yeah, 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 yeah. Joshua in the battle yeah. he has to choose men to fight against Amalek yeah, yeah, yeah. but then there's that iconic picture then of Moses on the mountain yeah, yeah. Moses on the mountain yeah. with his arms raised yeah. and you know the story church family when Moses' arms are up Israel is winning the battle. But when Moses' arms are down, Israel is losing the battle. Aaron and her are there with Moses. One gets under one hand, the other gets under the other hand, and one puts a rock under him for him to be able to sit down. That's an iconic picture of Moses on the mountain. Church family, can I suggest to you today that in this picture of Moses on the mountain, there's something about this narrative that we are that we are tempted to miss and that is this this is the first unauthorized use of Moses's rod that you find in the Exodus narrative God told Moses to use the rod in front of Pharaoh God told Moses to use the rod at the Red Sea but God, God told Moses to use the rod and to get water out of the rock. Yeah, yeah. But God ain't tell Moses nothing about holding no stick up no. and, and Israel getting victory. No, no, no. There were no divine instructions for this. Moses said, I'm going up on the mountain and I'm going to hold the stick up for the time that the battle is raging. This is the first unauthorized use and you got to be careful about using God's stick. When God hadn't given you authorization. Here's why. Because your hands can't handle God's stick. Look, look, look at what the text says. The text says Moses' hands grew weary. That's a word play in the original Hebrew. That word weary there means Moses' hands grew heavy. You, you want to know why Moses' hands grew heavy? It wasn't that the problem was in Moses' hands. The problem was the stick. The stick was too heavy for Moses to try to carry unauthorized. And I want to remind somebody here tonight, you better be careful about how you try to handle God's stick. Because your only ability to be able to hold the staff up is when God authorizes you to use that stick. But when you contrive that you're going to go and use that stick according to your own devices, I've discovered that the stick is too heavy for our weak and frail hands. There's some pastor here tonight, I've come to tell you, that's why you're on the brink of depression. I, I, I've come to tell you tonight, that, that's why you're fatigued and you're, re, you're getting ready to fall out. Uh, some preacher here tonight, that's why you're depressed and disgusted. Could it be that it's not the devil that's wearing you down? Could it be that you're trying to carry God's stick in a way that God didn't authorize you to carry it? And when you hold God's stick in a way that you are not authorized to hold it, then you got to hold it up under your own power. And when you got to hold it up under your own power, the inevitable end is that your arms will not be strong enough to handle God's stick. Moses thought uh, that, that, that what happened at the Red Sea was going to happen here at Amalek. That what happened at Mara was going to happen here at Rephidim. Yeah, yeah. That what happened at the rock is going to happen here at Rephidim. And Moses was made to look weak in front of the children of Israel. 
I'm out of here, church family. But I need to suggest to you today that this is not a text to suggest that somebody needs to help the pastor. This is a text to warn the pastor about using God's stick in unauthorized ways. And I want to suggest to you tonight that you better make sure that it's God's plan and not your plan. Because if it's your plan, God will handicap you in the sight of those that you're supposed to lead. If it's your plan, God will allow your arms to get weak in front of the people that you're trying to look strong for. If it's your plan, God will allow you to fade like a picture in a broken glass in front of the people that you're supposed to lead. But if it's God's plan, I've discovered that God will hold your arm up. But wait, church. Maybe what God is trying to tell Israel at Rephidim is that ultimately you need somebody who's stronger than Moses. Uh, you, you, you need somebody whose arms are strong enough to hold this thing up. And I want to suggest to you today, church family, that's why I'm glad that Moses wasn't the last man on the mountain. That, that's why I'm glad that Moses wasn't the last man on a hill. That, that's why I'm glad tonight that Moses wasn't the last leader who went up on a hill. But there was another deliverer. There, there, there was another man who went up on another hill. And he didn't need anybody to hold his hands up. His hands were strong enough to bear the load. His, his hands were strong enough to carry the burden. His hands were strong enough. And that man was Jesus. And it was on a hill far away. Stood in an old rugged cross. And that cross was the emblem of suffering and shame. But I love that old cross. Where the dearest and the best for a world of lost sinners was slain. There's another man on another mountain. And there is a fountain that's filled with blood. And it's drawn from Emmanuel's vein. And sinners plunge beneath that flood. Yeah, yeah. Lose all their guilt and their stain. Yeah. I like what the hymn writer says. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sin away thy dying lamb thy precious blood shall never lose you its power lord till all the ransomed church of god are saved to sin no more and and when this feeble faltering tongue lies silent in the grave and then in a noble sweeter song I will sing of his power to save and I don't know how you feel about it tonight but I'm glad I'm glad I'm glad that there was another man on another mountain and I want to know is there anybody here tonight that thanks God that Jesus his arms were strong enough to win the battle Lord, and I like how the text closes. The Bible says that, uh, that when Moses won the battle, uh, that the Lord spoke to Moses and, and told him, write it down in a book. Lord, and, and what do you want me to write in the book, God? And, well, uh, this is what I want you to write in the book. Yeah, that uh, when you face 
another Amalek Lord and when you face another battle you need to know that just like I fought this Amalek the Lord will fight your battle for you Lord, and I'm so glad tonight that I can testify of that when I have Amaleks of that arise in my life, I've got a God who's able to fight my battles. And I've got a God who's able to hold the weight of the battle in your hand. And that's why I'm glad I heard the Lord say, I hang on the throne from henceforth forevermore. Whenever you face an Amalek, I'm going to fight because my name is Jehovah Nisi. Lord, and what that means is my name is your, in your banner. Moses, yeah, yawns aren't strong enough to win the battle. But that's all right, Moses. My name is strong enough to win the battle. And I've come to tell somebody tonight, the name of the Lord. Lord is a strong tower. The righteous can run in and be saved. The Jehovah Nisi will fight my battles. I gotta leave you here tonight. But what do you do when the Lord gives you victory in dry places? Moses shows you what to do. Build an altar there and learn how to worship the name of God. And I'm so glad that I've got a witness here tonight that can testify God has won some battles in my life. Can you shake a neighbor's hand tonight and look your neighbor in the eye and say, neighbor, I know Jehovah needs you. I know the Lord will uh, fight my battles. Uh, come on, shake another neighbor's hand uh, and say, Name, I'm still here. I'm here because the Lord uh, has fought my battles. I'm here tonight uh, because the Lord uh, defeated cancer uh, in my body. Uh, I've had some tricky trustees. I've had some devilish deacons. I've had some messy members. But I'm still here because the Lord, He is my banner. I've had some ups and downs in life. But I'm here because the Lord, He is my banner. That's what the hymn writer said. Be not dismayed. A beer tied you, God will take care of you. I believe his wings of love abide. God will take care of you. Can you shake one more neighbor's hand and say, Neighbor, I've been in some dry places. Come on, help me preach here. Shake a neighbor's hand and say, Neighbor. I've been in some dry places. Say name. I dealt with this in my life, but I've got victory even in dry places. Tell me who can send me for us when we call on that great name, Jesus, my burden bearer. Jesus, my heavenly Lord Sarah. Jesus, my doctor in a sick room. Jesus, my lawyer in a courtroom. Jesus, my walking cane when I get weary. Jesus, can you call his name tonight? Jesus, in the morning. 
Jesus in the new day, Jesus in the midnight hour, and the more I call him, the better I feel, the more I call him, the better I feel, can you find one more neighbor, shake one more neighbor's hand, and shout neighbor, help me call his name, can you help me call his name, I don't know what he's been to you, but if he's been all right to you, call him Jesus, 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 I wish I had a witness in here. Oh, Jesus, yes, sir. Anybody know his name? Mary's baby, Jude's brother. Anybody know his name? Anybody have the victory tonight in a dry place? If you got the victory tonight in a dry place, why don't you give God a praise offering and shout thank you? I never would have made it. I never would have survived it. I never would have come through it. I would have lost my mind. I would have gone on there. I would have gave out. But the Lord, yes sir, the Lord, the Lord, one question won't he do it ain't he able ain't it alright shout yeah shout yeah Stand where you are. Stand where you are. Pastor Christopher, go and give us that closing prayer.